Good afternoon. You have seen on this stage in the last 36 hours some outstanding U.S. military officers, Admiral Davidson, Admiral Schultz, General Ashley. You're just about to see a great American diplomat. And American power rests not just on the military, but on our diplomats. Ambassador Jim Jeffrey is one of our very greatest ambassadors of the last 30 years to Turkey and to Iraq, Deputy National Security Advisor. He's also, as we say in Boston, we're both members of Red Sox Nation, wicked smart. <laughs> and you'll see that in a minute. And I want to give credit to President Trump and Secretary Mike Pompeo because what they've done on the toughest regional issues, they've hired Ambassador Zal Halizad to be their envoy in Afghanistan, Ambassador Steve Beacon to be their envoy in North Korea, Ambassador Elliot Abrams to be the envoy in Venezuela, and Ambassador Jim Jeffrey to be the envoy in Syria. Four really strong American diplomats, and I think the Trump administration has been right to hire them. I just have the greatest respect for Jim and the greatest respect for Josh Rogan, Washington Post. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you all for coming. It's been eight and a half years since the Syrian people took to the streets to peacefully demand basic rights and simple dignity and were attacked by their own government, sparking a civil conflict that has resulted in at least 400,000 civilians killed, over 5 million refugees, millions more internally displaced civilians, hundreds of thousands fleeing right now in Idlib for their lives, tens of thousands of civilians in custody in Assad's dungeons, being tortured, slaughtered as we speak, as we sit here. And after eight and a half years, the most common response we see is for people to turn away. So before we start, I'd like to thank the Aspen Institute for not turning away, for making time to keep Syria on the agenda. And I'd like to thank Ambassador Jim Jeffrey for not turning away and for dedicating his time to serving our country and to serving the interests of the Syrian people. And let's give them a round of applause. For those of you who don't know, James Franklin Jeffrey has started his service for the US government in the Nixon administration as an infantry soldier serving in Germany and Vietnam. He joined the Foreign Service <laughs> in 1977, served as for, under the George W. Bush administration as Deputy National Security Advisor, U.S. Ambassador to Albania during the Obama administration, as U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, and U.S. Ambassador to Iraq. Uh, he's known for speaking his mind, and to the extent that he is sometimes misunderstood, it's mostly due to his Boston accent. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, when I was asking people what I should ask you today, at this, I got the same answer over and over again. And the simple question is, what is U.S. Syria policy? Uh, thanks for raising that, Josh, and thank you for your comments. Uh, also, Nick, uh, and again, uh, thank you for the Aspen Institute for inviting us here. Uh, there are three core misunderstandings about uh, Syria. Uh, the first is that Assad has won. No, he hasn't. As Charles Lister just wrote in Foreign Policy, uh, he has survived so far. He has lost his own population. We can get into this. He has lost the international community, and he's hanging on. The second is uh, that this is a conflict like many others we turn away from in the broader Middle East, uh, Libya and South Sudan today, uh, uh, Yemen yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, this is, as you just laid out, an extraordinarily dangerous uh, conflict that is both an internal conflict and it's an international conflict. Aside from the Syrian army, such as it is, we have five outside military forces operating. Uh, the US, Turkish, Iranian, Russian, and while not uh, publicly acknowledged most of the time, the Israeli Air Force. And believe me, that leads to some pretty dangerous uh, interactions from time to time. Uh, but the third uh, misconception, uh, as you just raised, is the US doesn't have a uh, policy on Syria or it's an inconsistent one. We hear this from everybody. I was with Mike Pompeo when we were uh, talking about Syria with uh, uh, none other than Vladimir Putin in uh, Sochi uh, two months ago in May. And uh, afterwards, uh, Putin spoke to his press and 
Lo and behold, uh, after hearing Mike Pompeo lay out in great detail our policy, Putin immediately said the American policy on Syria is incomprehensible and nobody understands it. Well, let me try to help today. Uh, first of all, for the last several years, uh, we have had uh, a single policy. It's not the same policy that we've had over the, uh, all eight and a half years, but it's one that we've been consistent with and we've made public uh, hundreds of times at every level. First of all, it's to get all Iranian forces out of Syria. They uh, are an immediate existential threat to Israel, but also to Saudi Arabia and other countries. Secondly, to ensure the enduring defeat of uh, Daesh or ISIS. That is another creation of Assad's uh, war on his own people, this terrible terrorist organization, only the biggest of several really threatening ones we have now in Syria. And thirdly, a political process that changes the behavior of this state in fundamental ways. This isn't regime change. We're not trying to overthrow Assad per se. That's for the people to do under a UN process that was laid out in the last administration in Security Council Resolution 2254. We're adhering to it. Even our detailed tactics have been laid out, uh, none other than by Donald Trump at the UN General Assembly back in September a year ago. He said, what we're trying to do is to de-escalate the conflict and to reinvigorate the political process. Uh, that is in line with, in fact, it's basically taken from 2254, and this is what we're all doing night and day. So yes, we do have a policy. It's the right policy, and I'm convinced we're making progress. Thank you. Let's uh, take those in reverse order. Let's start with the political solution. Now, UN, our acting ambassador to the UN, Jonathan Cohen, told the Security Council that it was time to scrap the Geneva effort and think about another uh, way to go about this. Uh, that happened in the middle of while you, you were traveling to Israel and Russia and lots of other places to try to affect this exact political settlement. So is there a division inside the uh, uh, Trump administration on the way forward for a political settlement? And can you tell us what exactly it is that you're negotiating? Is it for the Constitutional uh, Commission, or is it something more comprehensive than that? Uh, this is why I didn't want to be interviewed by Josh Rogan. <laughs> We're off to a really great start, huh? Uh, Jonathan Cohen is one of my best friends. And uh, he was making reference to the repeated failures to get the Russians to live up to their commitments, because we don't deal directly with the Assad regime, or for that matter, the Iranians on Syria. We deal through the Russians. The Russians have promised us to begin this Resolution 2254, political process for a different Syria with a constitutional committee that would meet and either reform or uh, replace the current constitution. Uh, we were running into great difficulties when Jonathan made his uh, comments, uh, in part because uh, the Russians felt pressured by what he said. They turned on the heat. Uh, they sent their uh, top Syria team, my counterparts, twice to Damascus. Uh, unusually, they met with Assad. And uh, suddenly, we saw things breaking loose. So Jonathan did the right thing, saying what he said when he said it. And now the situation, because he said it, has changed for the better. We're not there yet. Uh, we're looking for a group of 150 people from the opposition from the government and from civil society to meet in Geneva under UN auspices to try to put together a different Syria. Uh, there are a couple of minor technical uh, issues uh, outstanding. Normally, from my experience, these are the things you resolve in three phone calls. The fact we don't indicates that Assad hasn't taken that final decision yet. Uh, and uh, more importantly, perhaps, President Putin hasn't taken the decision to call him. So, so we're waiting on that. That makes perfect sense. So that leads to two follow-up questions. One. It seems that the Russians have been stringing us along with this political process for about eight and a half years. And we were constantly told, not just by this administration, by the previous administration, that, oh, we have to test the Russians. We have to test mm -hmm. their integrity. We have to test their willingness to go down this road. At what point have they failed the test? Um, every day that they do not acknowledge that there will not be a military solution to this conflict and that the only way forward, the only way to get the half of the population, 12 million people who have fled Assad and are now in IDP camps in parts of Syria Assad doesn't control or in neighboring countries or in Europe to come back. Uh, until that happens, uh, there is going to be a continued uh, pressure on Assad, on the Russians to try to live up to the resolution that 2254 that they signed in December of 2015. That is our message to them. And we're seeing this on the ground right now in the province of Idlib. 
where despite massive Russian bombings of civilians and a major offensive by Assad's forces against the opposition, they're making almost no progress. There is no military solution. That's what we're hammering the Russians with. I, I do want to get to Idlib, but I just want to finish this one point on the diplomatic process. It depends on Assad agreeing. What indication do you have, if any, that Assad and his regime are ever going to make these concessions that they haven't made in in half years? And if there, if you know, it, it seems to me, it seems to a lot of us that the Assad regime has no intention of ever making these concessions, because of course, why would they when they perceive to be winning on the ground, more or less? And if they don't make the concessions, what's Plan B? Uh, well, a, they're not winning on the ground uh, as they just have seen in Idlib. Now, Idlib is something new. They started that offensive. Uh, there was a ceasefire agreed between the Russians and the Turks, because the Turks also have troops in Idlib uh, back in September, under a lot of pressure uh, from President Trump personally and all of us in this administration and throughout the entire uh, international community on the Russians to have a ceasefire. It was broken largely by the Russians and Syrians two months ago in this last gasp attempt to have a uh, military victory. We are trying to leverage the fact they have made no real progress to show them once again you cannot win this war. You can't take back the 40 percent of the country, the 50 percent of the arable land, and the two-thirds of the hydrocarbon reserves uh, without negotiating with the international community. That's the message we keep on making to the Russians and ultimately through them to Assad. Uh, are they stubborn? Yes. Were the Iranians stubborn in uh, the five years they fought in southern Iraq? They were. They refused to ever consider retreating until one day they retreated. We're hoping something like that will happen. Is there a, a Trump administration plan to increase the cost for the Russians as they spend money and blood and treasure in Idlib? Aren't there ways that we could make that calculation, that leverage even uh, more powerful? And are we doing those things? Right. Again, our plan B is to work with the Russians on this compromise solution step by step through the political process through to uh, UN monitored uh, national elections and a government that will actually behave like a normal country in return for foreign forces beginning with the Iranians withdrawing ceasefires. So that's the program that we're putting on the table. Until then, we're trying in every way to up the pressure. There's military pressure simply by the fact that US forces are uh, with our local allies fighting uh, the remnants of Daesh or ISIS uh, in the northeast of the country and along the Jordanian-Iraqi border. The Turks are in the northwest. Again, uh, if you believe press accounts, uh, the Israelis are operating almost uh, unchallenged in the airspace over Syria. So there's military pressure. There's economic pressure. Uh, there are very extensive sanctions on Syria. You heard uh, about some of them um, from Sagal Manzikert this morning on the discussion of Iran. They're very closely linked to the sanctions on Iran, and they're working. For example, when the British seized uh, the tanker hitting for Syria several weeks ago in Gibraltar, that was based upon European Union sanctions against Syria. It wasn't uh, related to our bilateral uh, Iranian uh, sanctions. It was related to EU sanctions against uh, Syria because the EU is our partner in this. We've also been successful in blocking any reconstruction assistance to this regime or any of the areas that the regime controls until we see the political process, and that's working. Finally, diplomatic pressure. Uh, uh, Syria was thrown out of the uh, Arab League at the beginning of the conflict. It has tried with Russian help to come back. Uh, it was rejected once again in March at an Arab League summit, and we think that the Arabs will hold the line against uh, Syria coming back. So we have pressure from all three sources. Got it. Thank you. Uh, specifically on Idlib, um, when the Assad regime and its Russian and Iranian partners uh, began their assault in September 2018, uh, President Trump to his credit, uh, called on his officials to put, apply pressure for the assault to stop. And he tweeted, after meeting with some Syrian Americans who explained to him uh, the severity of the issue. And there is a lot of evidence to say that his actions actually caused the offensive to stop or at least pause at that time. Uh, President Trump later said, quote, I said, don't let it happen. And it stopped. You saw that. No one's ever going to give me credit, but that's OK. And I meant it to. And millions of people have been saved. President Trump tweeted again just last month. This time the tweet didn't stop the offensive. So it seems as if the president's attention and uh, dedication to this is no longer having the same effect. And I'm wondering if you can tell me at, inside the administration, uh, how does the president view the current situation 
inside Syria, especially in Idlib, and is he willing to authorize more aggressive steps in light of the fact that the tweets are no longer doing the job? Well, aside from uh, the tweets, and I'll come back to the tweets in a second, because they're an interesting example of uh, multilateral diplomacy on several planes. Uh, uh, the president, uh, after seeing that uh, uh, we wouldn't find a lot of coalition partners to take over our role on the ground in northeast Syria, uh, after he announced uh, the withdrawal of our forces uh, with the uh, imminent demise of uh, ISIS, uh, changed his mind on that because he realized the importance of Syria. We're still withdrawing our forces uh, bit by bit, but we plan on having a uh, small residual force to remain on for an indefinite time. Uh, he is much seized with this. Uh, we don't give him this Idlib language. Uh, he seizes it himself because he's focused very much on it. Uh, it does have an effect. Going back to uh, September, it was a combination of him uh, raising that, the fear of the three and a half million people who are in Idlib, most of them have fled from Assad in other parts of Syria, fleeing again to Turkey and on to Europe, and the fact that both the opposition and the Turks were reinforcing and making it clear that they would fight. And all of these things reinforced the other. So you had military, you had humanitarian, and you had diplomatic pressure. And then all of our allies, the Europeans, the UN, they all got on top of this. Uh, Secretary General Guterres has spoken out repeatedly, including in the last few weeks. We have a similar phenomenon now. That offensive is not officially over, but it is petered pretty much out. Unfortunately, the bombing of civilians is continuing, and uh, the Russians were just savaged yesterday in the UN in open session over it. And they'll continue to be savaged until we see progress there. So I think that in his own way, uh, he succeeded this time too. Well, let me press you on that because we've seen the Russian Assad offensive in Idlib go back and forth. It'll go strong for a little while. They'll, they'll lose some towns. They'll gain some towns. The Russians will add forces. They'll take back forces. But the killing continues. Yeah. The effort continues. The suffering continues. And so uh, I would sort of challenge the assertion that it's, petering out in the sense that the, their goals continue and the objectives continue. And what we see is hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the Turkish border. So can you, first of all, take us into your discussion with the Russians about this. Uh, what, what, do they, what, are, what do they say about what they're doing yeah. in Idlib, which seems to be a clear violation of everything they've ever promised? And then also take us to, into your conversations with the Turks about this. Are they going to open the border? Mm -hmm. Are they going to provide for all of these people who are sleeping under olive trees? What, what's their plan? Right. Uh, what the Russians say, and it has some truth, is that in the ceasefire agreement with the Turks back in uh, September, the Turks agreed to clear uh, a major terrorist group, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is an al-Qaeda offshoot uh, that went until recently by the name al-Nusra that many people who deal in counterterrorism in this hall are well aware of, uh, that they would get them under control, disarm them, uh, and the Turks have not been able to do that. In fact, HDS, as we call it, has strengthened its position in Idlib. So that's the first argument. The second one is uh, HDS and other opposition elements have been shelling a Russian base to the south of Idlib. Uh, and so uh, from the Russian standpoint, this is a violation of the ceasefire. From our standpoint, this was minor shelling. We didn't see much damage or casualties from it. Uh, and it's more an excuse uh, than a uh, reasonable reaction. Certainly nothing would justify the unleashing of these bombing attacks against civilians. Uh, so we uh, are willing to work with the Russians and the Turks on the HTS uh, issue, but we don't see this as a justification for what's clearly an attempt to uh, suck up to Assad by meeting his demand, which he kept making after the ceasefire in September, for the ceasefire to be broken and this piece of territory to be captured as he did all of the others. The Southwest a year ago this summer, Aleppo uh, 12 months before, and on and on. It's not going to happen. Uh, in terms of the Turks, uh, first of all, we support their position, which is the ceasefire has to be restored. Uh, the forces have to uh, draw back to their ceasefire lines. Uh, and uh, we are very encouraged that the Turks are reinforcing their positions all along. They've had two people killed and over a dozen wounded. Uh, they've engaged the Syrian army in counter-battery fire when necessary. Uh, so the Turks are uh, maintaining a strong position there. They're supporting the opposition in many different ways I won't get into, but it's effective. Uh, but we are talking to the Turks about uh, how we will all together go after these terrorist cells and particularly the terrorist leadership. In fact, we've offered to the Russians many times that we have, as 
again, many people in this hall know, very unique capabilities to target terrorist leadership. Uh, the Russians keep on saying no, so we don't take their uh, uh, claims that they're doing all of this to fight terror very uh, seriously. If they wanted to fight terror, they'd cooperate more with us. Isn't it tough to cooperate with the Russians on fighting terrorism when they define civilians and hospitals and schools and orphanages as legitimate terrorist targets? Right, and anybody in the opposition. Now, officially, diplomatically, uh, they have the same list uh, that the UN uh, has declared as we do, but uh, they essentially, in their behavior by the Russian military, go along with the Assad regime's view that anybody who takes up uh, arms against uh, certainly the worst regime I have seen in my uh, 50 years of uh, government service uh, is a terrorist, and uh, that's a problem that uh, we're going to have to deal with. Thank you, thank you. So you're, it, the Turkish media has reported that you're on the way to uh, Ankara after this. Can, is that right? And uh, what's, the, what's on the agenda? Well, I can't confirm uh, media rumors, uh, but I'm in Ankara all of the time. The reason is that we have uh, uh, a very large agenda on Syria uh, with uh, the Turks. Uh, uh, they are our partners uh, in many respects in the Northwest in the fight against Daesh and in Idlib. They're our partners in the political process. Uh, they have good ties with the opposition and often represent them to the United Nations. We're in sync on that. Uh, we differ on our role in Northeast Syria. We are partnered with the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, which is led by uh, essentially an offshoot of the PKK, a group that has had uh, roots with the PKK, which is a Turkish uh, anti-Ankara uh, terrorist group. Uh, we don't recognize the people in Syria as a terrorist group. Uh, they're not on our or the UN's list. The Turks do. Uh, they feel that we shouldn't be partnering with them, and uh, they have threatened at various times to go in and act militarily against them, and we're trying to work out what we call a safe zone where uh, those uh, Kurdish forces would pull back from the Turkish border, uh, and we would find ways to uh, make sure that the Turks are not threatened. How's uh, that going? Uh, it's uh, going. <laughs> Do you care to expand on that? Uh, going, I think, is a pretty thorough answer. Uh, <laughs> five letters and uh, forward progress. I would say that uh, uh, we understand Turkey's security concerns. On the other hand, we still have a big mission fighting Daesh or ISIS in northeast Syria. I was just there uh, as a caliphate holding territory. They have been destroyed totally. But... Uh, they still have many cells that have infiltrated into uh, areas, particularly along the Euphrates, and there's considerable uh, back-sweeping action by the SDF, uh, supported by the U.S., and that's going to have to continue. We can't afford to be, uh, have a messy situation with the Turks coming in, then possibly the regime, uh, Assad, would come in, the Russians would come in. Uh, it would be a terrible mess to sort out. Well, since you brought it up, it seems uh, clear that it's even tougher to sort out the security of Northeast Syria as we withdraw. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, as everyone knows, when the president announced that withdrawal by tweet, he didn't consult anybody, he didn't tell the joint chairman of the chiefs of staff. I assume that if the joint chairman of the chiefs of staff and the secretary of defense didn't get a call, I'm assuming that you didn't get a call, uh, secretary of defense resigned, the special envoy for ISIL coalition, Brett McGurk, resigned, but you stayed. So tell us, first of all, why you stayed, mm -hmm. and then second of all, you know, now that this withdrawal has been mitigated, we can't say how many troops there are gonna be, but there are gonna be a couple. How do we do more with less, and how do we show our commitment to fighting ISIS in mm -hmm. Northeast Syria while we're, the president is saying we have to get out? Uh, uh, well, the first thing I did uh, when I heard about this was to check with my boss, Mike Pompeo, and uh, we actually, uh, learned specifically what the president had decided. He wasn't abandoning Northeast Syria. This is what he was saying, and he had raised it before and was talked out of it. Uh, we would still stay in Northeast Syria with our most important component, which is our air cover over the Northeast, which keeps uh, uh, the four other powers out of it, or at least three of the other powers. Uh, secondly, uh, we would continue, as he said, in Ali al Assad Air Base in uh, Iraq a few days later. We would continue uh, to use our high end special operations and counterterrorism missions if we identified targets in the Northeast. And we would support our coalition coming in. His logic was hey, the United States took on the burden of organizing an 80 country and 
uh, organization coalition against ISIS. When ISIS had territory as big as Britain and 35,000 uh, jihadists under its command. We smashed that in a campaign over several years. At times we had up to 15,000 US troops on the ground in Iraq and Syria. We spent tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of airplanes uh, leading this coalition. We basically had completed the job by December. He thought, and you know his views on burden sharing, and I am uh, in agreement with much of it, uh, that uh, we need to turn to our allies to do follow-on missions when the big job, smashing a caliphate that has very heavy uh, forces, very heavy weapons and uh, thousands and thousands of forces, uh, is done. That's what we did. We turned to our coalition partners and said, why don't you provide uh, some number, certainly it would be le lower than 1,000, uh, that could stay on and help the local forces keep uh, ISIS from coming back, which it happened in Iraq after 2012. Uh, and everybody said, sorry, uh, uh, we're in with you, we're out with you. So if you don't stay on, uh, we won't be able to uh, uh, provide any contributions. When that was passed back to the president, he decided that, as I said, he would continue his withdrawal of American forces while encouraging other countries to up their presence there, but that we would also keep uh, a small contingent for the indeterminate future. That's where we are now, and I think that uh, we will have uh, many more countries participating in our efforts in the Northeast than we had a year ago. Have you, have you gotten commitments from allies? including the British and the French, to increase their troop levels in the Northeast? Uh, it's a funny thing about Northeast Syria. Even when we do get commitments, uh, we don't get permission to publicize the commitments. So I'll just Does that say, mean you have commitments without permission to publicize? I, you know, that, would, that is such an unfair twisting of my words, uh, <laughs> which I thought were perfectly clear. We, we don't make commitments even when we have commitments, which I but would... You don't have to tell us what the commitments are, okay. who the commitments are, uh, so nobody could get angry at you. Just... Okay. Either there are commitments okay. or there aren't commitments. I am sure that we will have formal commitments from a significant number of countries. countries. But right now, no commitments. Right now, I would say that we are well on the way to getting formal commitments by a good number of countries, <laughs> far more than were there a year ago, and that this will be a satisfactory outcome. How's Understood. that? I, that I, I think we understand perfectly. Um, <laughs> ISIS. Yeah. 10,000, 30,000, how many are left? What's the best um, guesstimate? I've heard 10,000, I've heard 30,000. I've heard between 10 and 15,000 between Iraq and Syria. Now Syria. bear in mind, that is what we call the core. They're very active in uh, the Sinai in Egypt. They're active in uh, uh, Somalia. They're active in- Just what for we call, Syria, just for right Yeah, now. for Syria. Well, for Syria uh, we don't put a number on that because they float back and forth between Iraq and Syria. They consider it one front. We organized ourselves to consider it one front under one coalition command commanded by a U.S. three-star general. I've heard 370 attacks since March attributed to ISIS in Syria alone. Does that match what you're, mm. what you're getting? And if that, or let's say even if, let's say it's 100, that seems pretty serious. What are we doing to increase our attention to the, what is clearly a rising ISIS activity. Uh, in, in 10 minutes in one forward U.S. position in Syria 10 days ago, I heard heavy machine gun fire from three directions in five minutes. Are those three separate attacks by whom? We don't know. It was at night. Uh, uh, in terms of casualties, the casualties from ISIS attacks in Syria are still very, very low uh, in terms of what we, and many of us, experienced in Iraq, uh, unfortunately. So I would say it is a very low level insurgency in Northeast Syria right now. Now, it is raging out of control south of the Euphrates uh, in areas that the regime, Assad regime, is supposed to control. Why? Because their best troops are conducting this vain attack on Idlib and ISIS is taking advantage. They just hit the main gas pipeline from Palmyra to the populated areas in the west of Syria. Uh, it's also a bigger threat in Iraq where ISIS, which has its roots, is basically the Al-Qaeda in Iraq force that I knew when I was there in 2011 or 12, or I knew about, uh, has now regenerated itself in some of the areas where they always had supporters. So we're watching Iraq more seriously than, uh, not more seriously, but we're watching it more closely right now than Northeast Syria. So it's fair to say ISIS is not yet defeated. It's fair to say that the caliphate, which was a unique, which was a physical force that was able to project power in terms of terrorist attacks all over Europe, 
indirectly to the United States and elsewhere, that has been fortunately defeated, and that was a huge and difficult military task. ISIS, as a terrorist group analogous to al-Qaeda, is still there and in many other places. Thank you. Uh, just today, uh, the Department of Justice announced charges against an American citizen who became an ISIS emir who was training ISIS snipers. Uh, America, the U.S. citizens fighting in Syria, relatively small number, uh, is that, but there are thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of citizens from countries all over the world, especially Europe, who have joined ISIS and are now sitting in camps, 70,000 people in one camp, family members, women, children, for months. Mm -hmm. What's the plan to deal with them? Um, okay. Uh, let me start with the numbers. Uh, there's, as you said, somewhat over 70,000 people in a major uh, uh, IDP, internally displaced persons, or a uh, camp. Uh, That's Al Hol. Al Hol. And uh, about 60,000 of them are Iraqi or Syrian. So we're working with our local partners to get the Syrians back to their homes, largely along the Euphrates and Arab areas. And we're working with the Iraqi government. I was just there uh, 12 days ago. Uh, to get the Iraqi government to expedite the return of their own citizens. In terms of the terrorists themselves, there's about 10,000, 9 to 10,000 uh, prisoners. Uh, about 2,000 of them are international in the sense of not from Syria or Iraq. The rest are from Syria and Iraq. Step by step, we're moving the Iraqis back to Iraq. We're moving the Syrians uh, to justice within the Syrian system in the Northeast. And so the main problem is the 2,000... Uh, uh, what we call foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, Just to be clear, also 10,000 additional family members, women and children. Right, right, who are also not Iraqi or Syrian. Right, so, so in 12,000. Yeah, so in terms of the logistics, because we re require humanitarian support and U.S. government support to operate these things, along with a lot of support from the Syrian uh, democratic forces, uh, it's not the major problem. The major problem is the numbers Iraqi and Syrian. But in terms of getting those people back, that's a huge problem. The United States takes back uh, people who we believe were guilty of uh, fighting with ISIS, and we put them before courts, and we have ways to prosecute them. Uh, many of our uh, partner nations, particularly the Europeans, do not have good ways to do that. They have extremely high bars for prosecution, and they're very nervous about taking people back who they'll have to put out on the street. Nonetheless, that's the wrong decision. They can't be left there in Northeast Syria indefinitely. We're putting a lot of pressure on them. Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham has suggested they build a European Gitmo. Good idea, bad idea? Uh, I've never seen a Lindsey Graham idea I didn't think was pretty good, but uh, I would have to say that uh, the Europeans would have to decide that as one who worked on the Gitmo issue when I was in the uh, Bush White House. Uh, it's complicated, uh, even under the, in the American comp. Uh, context, and it would be extremely complicated uh, for Europeans. Uh, in another camp uh, in the southeast called Al Rukban camp, there are now, I would say, 30,000 yeah. civilians uh, living within 10 miles of a U.S. military base called Al Tamf. Uh, 200 soldiers, maybe 300, who knows, protecting 30,000 Syrian civilians who have fled the regime, who don't want to go back to the regime. There used to be 50,000 there. 20,000 of them actually went back to the regime. They probably got conscripted or detained or killed, frankly. Mm -hmm. but these are the 30,000 who don't want to be conscripted, detained, or killed. Starving, right? No humanitarian aid, living in squalor. And their main ask, and because they ask me this all the time personally, is for the US government to give them food and medicine. Um, up till now, our policy has not been to do that. Can you explain why that is? Yeah. And n now seeing that the, the scheme to you know, negotiate with the Russians mm -hmm. to make sure these people don't starve to death has run its course, why not uh, feed these starving people? Uh, many of them actually, the UN did a survey, do want to go back to their homes uh, in a side controlled territory, but they are, as you said, very nervous as they well should be because we've tracked what happens to people who do go back. Nonetheless, they would go back if assisted uh, with transportation. We're not going to allow them, however, to be starved into making this decision. Therefore, we've pressured the Russians, and in turn, through the Russians, the Assad regime, to provide humanitarian relief, which the UN organizes. We did two convoys, one in the fall, another one in February. Now, the Assad regime, again, we get back to the Assad regime, has said no. 
uh, and we're looking at our options right now. But this is one of the two or three most serious things that uh, I put time into on my job and people at considerably so higher levels than me do it. We have the capability to feed these people. Why not just feed them? Uh, because first of all, if we feed them, it will look like we're going to stay there forever. And there may be other options for them, for example, in the northeast or the northwest of the country, uh, where you're not under Assad's uh, thumb, but that requires negotiation and other things. Uh, and secondly, uh, we can't commit to a long-term presence uh, in Altam for any place else in Syria. Uh, that's one thing that, uh, you know, we're not once, there. Once we feed them, we'll have to keep feeding them. There is that fear. Again, we're looking at every option available to us at this time. We're gonna, oh, I'm going to open up the questions, so get your questions ready. Um, but my last question, and I've been thinking about this one a lot, uh, is that you know, when I talk to people about Syria, and I'm sure you have the same experience, Americans often say, you know, that's over there, right? We get why that's a tragedy for Syrians. We get why that's a security threat for Israel. We even get why it's a security threat for Europe. But Americans, te uh, I've found, don't understand what's the US interest in Syria. And that's my question. What's the U.S. interest in Syria? Why, sure. why, why must we care? Sure. Two or three reasons. First of all, uh, the terrorist threat. Uh, we've seen two of the largest terrorist movements uh, since 9-11 uh, be born out of that conflict, uh, ISIS and HDS. Secondly, uh, again, it is in the center of the Middle East. The Middle East impacts us in so many ways. While we don't get our oil from uh, the Middle East anymore, or only minor amounts. Believe me, all of our trading partners from India and Japan to Europe do, and that has a huge impact on the global market for oil. And your price of gasoline at the pump is based on the global market for oil. And that can be impacted, as we're seeing to some degree today, by uh, a failure to maintain uh, security in the region. Thirdly, our allies and partners from NATO ally Turkey to, uh, in particular, Israel, who we have a very close relationship with and is facing an existential threat from Iran, and on to many other partners. And frankly, uh, the global order that uh, people can uh, challenge and question uh, how much of a role we play versus others. But at the end of the day, I have heard few people other than Vladimir Putin, and I wouldn't recommend following him, uh, who want to replace it with anything. So uh, we need to uh, support uh, the UN. We need to support our partners and allies in there, and we need to end this conflict. Thank you. Um, let's uh, go to questions. We'll start with Kim. And uh, please, everybody, put your comments in the form of a question. And we're going to try to get in as many as possible. Thank you. Kim Dozier, Daily Beast. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, you started with your list of the four goals in Syria with getting all Iranian three. forces. Sorry, three. Um, getting all Iranian forces out. That was very contested under Mattis's Pentagon. They said, this is all about Daesh and only Daesh, and we're not expanding the mission set to include Iran because, mm -hmm. hey, we, we could be there forever. Um, so do you have buy-in from Esper, from Bolton, from the president on the Iranian mission? And how long, realistically, is that going to take? Uh, it's a good question, and it, it comes, there's two ways to answer it. First of all, uh, and I live with this every day, but I'm not here to give you a seminar in political, civilian military relations and conduct of US foreign policy, but rather what I do in Syria. Uh, just because something is a US government policy for our diplomacy doesn't mean specifically which tools we use to carry it out. The military does not have a mission in Syria to evict the Iranians. It has a mission in Syria, aside from defending itself, to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. That has been uh, its policy ever since troops went in in 2014. Uh, that doesn't mean that the military, by its very presence there, by essentially controlling and denying terrain, does not contribute indirectly as military presence, as military activities do, to larger diplomatic um, goals and objectives. Our means to get Iran out is a negotiated settlement of this conflict 
and uh, enabling not only the Iranian forces, but the other forces that have entered since 2011. Four of the five militaries that I've cited, including our own, have come in because of this conflict. The only one that was there before was the Russians uh, to get them all out. So uh, it's this economic pressure, it's this diplomatic pressure, and this idea to do a deal that we're hoping would uh, be effective in getting the Iranians out. Uh, how effective will we be? Uh, I know that, once again, this is a very top priority for the U.S. administration, and it is a very important part of our overall Iran policy that we talked about earlier today. Uh, as a quick follow-up, are you seeing divisions between the Iranians and the Russians, especially when it comes to committing resources in the fighting? Um, you name two countries anywhere in the world, and I see division somewhere in our intelligence Increasing reporting. Increasing divisions. Uh, Increasing I, I, divisions. I, I would say... Uh, they do not have the same objectives. For example, the Russians do not want Iran to project long-range missile power out of Syria against Israel. I absolutely believe that. Whether the Russians have done enough against it, that's another question. Uh, but on the other hand, if you would look at our alliance of the UN, the Arabs, uh, Turkey, Israel, the uh, Kurds in the Northeast uh, in our policy, you would see a lot of divisions among them too. So I wouldn't read too much into uh, the debate between them. Fair enough. Next question. Uh, let's go right in the back. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Yes, you. Wait for the mic, please. Ambassador, just picking up. Uh, Could you let, let us know who you are? So John Scarlett, um, former head of MI6. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, picking up your last point there uh, about uh, Russia, Assad, uh, Iranians, and so on. I mean, is there not a sort of basic risk uh, that uh, we are continuing to misunderstand the objectives and indeed the capabilities um, of, uh, of Russia in, in particular? Um, I mean, they, obviously Iran is a challenge for them, but how really, how important is it for them to move Iran and the Iranians out of Syria? And has there been any progress on that at all? Um, and when I say it's a misunderstanding or risk of it, on the part of the Israelis, certainly when I talk to them, they place quite a lot of hope. They certainly did a year ago on that, and yet they, they can't show. The Russians like to have meetings and talk about it, but it, nothing has actually happened. And the degree and depth of the commitment to Assad, which goes back mm -hmm. you know, yeah. decades, um, uh, he's still there, mm -hmm. and he hasn't done too badly. And yeah. the Russians are feeling quite good about it, really. I mean, that's, you could look at it that way. Can I just hear your comments on that? Okay, one, the Russians were feeling quite good about it last summer after they gobbled up uh, southwest uh, uh, Syria. Uh, it's a year later, and the map hasn't changed. They're feeling less good about it, and that's something we try to leverage. Two, uh, I can't say that the Russians have uh, uh, complied with our requests on the Iranians because they haven't uh, gotten the Iranians out. Uh, they have taken some steps. I don't want to get into all the details. Uh, those steps were not satisfactory, but they have taken some steps on moving back Iranian forces from certain areas. Uh, again, it was not uh, You adequate. mean in the south? Yeah. Per their uh, agreement right. with the Israelis? Yeah, that's right. It was a deal that was done last summer. So there are uh, examples of it. The basic problem is uh, Russia's goal in the Middle East is to replace the U.S.-led collective security regional system with a great power system that Putin knows how uh, well to play, uh, Russia, U.S., uh, Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Uh, their ally Iran's mission in the U.S., in the region, is to replace the U.S.-led collective security system with an Iranian-led collective security system. So that's the friction between the two of them. But... Uh, under pressure to try to uh, uh, get a victory, they've managed to paper over these differences, but the differences are real. And the last question will come to me. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Jeffrey, there, by my reporting, are at least six American citizens mm -hmm. currently missing in Syria, believed to be held by the Assad regime. There are at least two American citizens who have been confirmed to be killed by the Assad regime, including a, one journalist and one activist. Is the Trump administration committed to holding the Assad regime and Bashar al-Assad himself accountable for these atrocities, and how you intend to do so? Uh, absolutely. We're doing this both through the UN, 
which has various accountability mechanisms, among the most robust I've ever seen, uh, and a lot of information, mainly from Syrians, is pouring into it. Uh, we also, in our own uh, detailed description of our policies that have been was provided at the end of February to the U.S. Congress in classified form, we've made it clear that accountability is one of the core issues we want to see with the change of uh, performance or behavior of the Assad government, along with no CW, no support of terrorism, no support of Iranian long-range threats to the region. But are you going to pursue that accountability in the courts now before the Assad regime decides to change and do all the right things? Are, are you, is the U.S. Mm -hmm. government going to bring these cases? Is uh, that work going on right now? Right now, the priority is to try to figure out where these Americans are. I can't confirm that they are in, under Assad's uh, control. There are a lot of rumors, or a lot of uh, people reporting out there. Uh, they're our priority right now. And the ones that are confirmed to have been killed by the Assad regime? Uh, How long must they wait for justice? Uh, we're collecting data on them, but right now our focus is on these people that are being held by Assad, or we think are being held by Assad or somebody else because there are many groups in Syria. Let's thank Ambassador Jeffrey for 45 minutes of real talk about the situation on the ground in Syria. I really appreciate it. The final session for this evening will begin in a half an hour at 6 p.m. at the Greenwald Pavilion.